Ms. Thankam Gomez, Entrepreneur, Founder, Chief Executive Officer, Signia Healthcare, New Delhi, Founder, President, ANEI. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Thankam Gomez. Over to you, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. Had your lunch? Okay. After lunch, what happens? Sleepy. Only few people are saying, no ma'am, no ma'am. A lot of people at the back, they are the thinking that we should go to sleep. So we will do a very quick one minute activity, okay? All of you get up. All of you get up, okay? Quickly, turn to your right. Turn to your right. All right. You need to find somebody standing in, in front of you. Okay, now put both hands on the other person in front of you, shoulders. Very good, very good. Now, please nicely massage the shoulder. <laughs> massage, massage. Lot of fun, massaging, very good. So now some people are right in front. They did not get the massage. So turn to the left. Now massage. Turn to the left. Now massage. Okay. Hearing all the laughter, people are coming back. Fantastic. Thank you very much and please be seated. Great. Now may I request all of you to now keep quiet. This session is very, very critical. One of our most proudest moment of patient safety. Annie lives by passion to action. So as uh, Captain Ajita informed, and I think Dr. Vincy also mentioned, we have Annie Patient Safety Fellowship Program. Every year we take seven to eight um, any members who are willing to undergo this program of two years and uh, the first year they do present their quality improvement projects that is one of the commitment that they make so this next track is about showcasing the projects done by nine of our patient safety fellows from cohort 2023 am i correct yes correct 2023 because fourth cohort is coming so in this track I am extremely honored, very, very humbled to have Dr. Michael Ramsey here with us. Can we have his slide? Yes. Many of you might already know him. He's the founder of Ramsey Scale. ICU nurses, I'm sure that all of you have heard about Ramsey Scale. And when I met him first, I really did not know he's the father of Ramsey Scale. And second time when I talked to him, I knew that he's the father. Then I was all over the place, you know, being a critical care nurse. But um, there is so much to learn from him. I, d I don't think I can do justice by explaining who he is, what awards, what he's doing. He's an accomplished, you know, very senior anesthetist of transplant. And now uh, he will be there in any global forum when patient safety is being discussed. That's how we are very proud and grateful for Patient Safety Movement Foundation, USA, and Dr. Michael Ramsey is the CEO of that foundation. They do a lot of work, and we try to learn from them and spread what we are learning. So this year, our any patient fellows are presenting actionable evidence-based practices, what is available on the website of Patient Safety Movement Foundation. So there is so much you can learn if we are only willing to learn. And we are grateful that these kind of forums we are able to talk about the 
possibilities. And I'm extremely proud now to invite Dr. Michael Ramsey to address the gathering. Sir, you Thank are you. visible. Thank you, so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, now I keep quiet and listen to you carefully. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try and share my screen with you and uh, see if I can get some slides up there. Uh, can you see my slides or not? Maybe not. Uh, let me try again. Sir, please share your presentation again. Okay, let me try. See if I can do it now. Ladies and gentlemen, where's Dr. Ramsey is sitting? It is 3 a.m. If he has no <laughs> excuse, none of us have any excuse whatsoever. Let me see if I can get the slides up now. Yes, sir, we can see. You can put it on slideshow, sir. Thank you. Okay. No, I think I've lost it again. Let me try one more time. Making it difficult. Sir, just uh, share it once again and just put it on slideshow. Maybe you got it minimized. You have it now? Yeah, just put it on slideshow, sir. Okay. Yes, good, good, perfect. Thank you, sir. Okay, all right, sorry about that, three o'clock in the morning. Um, okay, so this is, I'm the CEO of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and um, I just want to say a few words about it uh, before the fellows uh, discuss their projects. Uh, it was founded in 2012 with the aim of preventing preventable harm in our healthcare systems. And uh, we involve everybody involved in healthcare to be part of this foundation so we can get to the answer quicker. Um, but the challenge continues. We've been at it now for 12 years, and yet still we have urinary tract infections. We have medication errors that you've heard about. Um, and the WHO with Neelam Dinger have really got involved now and made this a global effort. Um, but we know the causes of error but we are still having a hard time reducing them. So we have a lot more work to do. In the US, we are now getting somewhere near the right number of preventable deaths in our healthcare systems. We think it's around 250,000, and that's an enormous number when you think about it. Uh, globally, uh, we think uh, it's much, much higher and um, with a massive cost. When we look at misdiagnoses, 7.4 million in the uh, United States. So what, what are we doing about it? And we have four main aims. One is we develop actionable evidence-based practices. They're living documents, but there's a right way of doing things so that uh, on many of the causes of preventable harm. For instance, we still have wrong site surgery. Some patient will have a kidney taken out from the wrong side for a cancer. Now they have to go back and have the other kidney taken out, which is going to put them on dialysis. So we need to have some evidence-based practices so that just can't happen. 
enough checklists that you have to go through working with the patient, marking the side, looking at the scan, so it just can't happen. We need to have aligned incentives. We don't want to be paying people for volume of work. We want to pay them for quality of outcomes. And uh, we want to have a national patient safety team to look at the uh, major um, problems that we have to see if we can come up with solutions using uh, the techniques that they use for transportation or nuclear power. And above all, we've got to have data transparency. We've got to know those numbers, and we're beginning to get it in the United States through uh, informatics and uh, using trigger tools on electronic records. So we want the culture of safety in every organization, transparency, and include everybody, especially the patient and the patient family. You know, there are challenges. We have to have system thinking, just like the airlines, nuclear power. We need our leadership involved from the top executives down uh, right through the system. That's the way you develop a safety culture. And of course, we've got to have the patients and patient families because they're the one experiencing the harm. We've got to improve, get everybody in healthcare involved so they're on the top of their game. And we want the general public too to support us. So, the role of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation in the current uh, uh, generation of patient safety agenda, it, we look at the global impact, and we now have um, ambassadors all around the world and uh, more joining us. We had our summit meeting. We had a very busy month this month. We had a summit meeting on September 6th, 7th at University of California. And these are some of the speakers we had, just some amazing people. Dr. Tedros uh, from the WHO, um, Dr. Naj Mashkadi, who has uh, examined a lot of nuclear power stations from Chernobyl to the Japanese ones. He's now investigating Boeing, and uh, his early report is that Boeing is not going to come out well from that investigation. They have a lot of problems that uh, they're going to get fixed. Um, but that's a really top class group of speakers. It was probably the best summit we've ever had, including Dr. Don Berwick again, who was the father of IHI. Um, then we've had there's some photographs. We had a big Mexican contingent there on the left. And we have a group of fellows too on our fellowship program that come from all around the globe. And uh, they were celebrating their uh, certification there. So, World Patient Safety Day has been mentioned. Uh, it was the uh, 27th, 17th of September. And um, the WHO came out with a lot uh, to really promote Patient Safety Day. Uh, we were down at the Capitol building on the 17th with a walk from the White House to the Capitol. Uh, and we planted flags, orange flags, on the grass outside. Then we got invited to the Capitol to the to the uh, White House itself, and uh, President Biden was going to meet us. Uh, unfortunately, he was not well that day, so we met his um, uh, people underneath him, uh, Dr. Teja Gandhi, who was with IHI and now uh, with Press Ganey was there as well, uh, and she's been a big leader in patient safety. Um, we were there with our founder. Uh, Joe Kiani of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and Mike Durkin, our chair of our board and also from the UK and um, uh, very much involved in global patient safety. Uh, we came up with, uh, or the president had a commission on, or council on, to advise him on patient safety last year. They came up with these four major recommendations, um, but he was going to announce them. He was going to put them in place in government-funded uh, health care, which is the majority in the United States. 65% of health care is government-funded. The rest is private practice. Um, but uh, in the government side, because he's already paying for it, he wouldn't have to get a vote in the House. And right now there's a tremendous contention between the two sides of the House. He probably would not get a vote in favor of the measures he wanted to put in. So we went back to him on Patient Safety Day to see it's one year later 
you didn't put these measures in place because you got distracted by the uh, Gaza Middle East problems. Um, can you do it now before you leave office? And uh, we had a big group there that uh, uh, petitioned him to put these in place. Um, we felt like the conversation was very positive, but we didn't get a positive signal from him until the very next day. And the very next day, we did get a positive. And it does look like he is going to start to put some of these actionable recommendations into place in the government-run healthcare system. That's Medicare, Medicaid, the Veteran Service, the Indian Service, uh, et cetera. Then we went to Mexico City to the Mexican Academy of Surgery and um, gave a talk to them. And they too are following us um, very uh, closely. And uh, both entities came up with a patient safety disaster response because we're so concerned about what's happening in conflicts around the world where hospitals, healthcare uh, centers are getting bombed, rocketed, or being used as cover uh, by one side or the other. And healthcare workers are getting killed uh, in these war zones. Um, and uh, this has got to stop. And so we're all united in that we want our hospitals to be safe havens when you're sick and not danger war zones um, as they become. Hospitals should be off limits to all combatants. And one of the uh, nurses in the Mexican Academy of Surgery gave a talk and she came up with this, uh, become patient safety guardians. I'd always thought about a patient safety uh, army, but she said guardians, we want you to be guardian angels. So we want you all, uh, particularly the fellows who are now coming up to present to be our guardian angels and take care of our healthcare system, our employees, the healthcare workers and the patients. So with that, I want to thank you very much indeed uh, for inviting me. And uh, I'm looking forward to these presentations uh, to see what the fellows have been doing. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, <clears throat> very heartening to hear about the progress the US government is making. And we also hope that someday uh, we are also going to make roads to Delhi Parliament and talk about patient safety. I think nothing should stop us from dreaming the highest fight that we can put up for patient safety and healthcare worker safety. Both safeties are very important. So we totally, we are in sync with you once again. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, last time, sir, uh, had asked us that we should all, we all should become safety soldiers. So I said, now the soldiers will also become guardian angels, for sure. So that responsibility is now being given to our any patient safety fellows. So without much delay, uh, I would like to present our nine fellows quality improvement projects, just to ensure that we are on time. All of them have been pre-recorded, but they are present here, barring one person. All are here, so in alphabetical order, I will invite <coughs> Mr. Abdul Razak, our patient safety fellow, the only male warrior <laughs> from last year, to do the presentation. So I would request the fellows to be just on the stage and uh, while the video is being played, and I have requested Dr. Ramsey that he will sum up once all the project presentations are done. All the best to all of you. And I really hope the audience will pay attention to understand what projects they have done, what is the learning that you can take away from here. That's very important. Thank you very much. Over to you, Abdul. Patient Safety Fellowship. I'm here to present about the project, what I have conducted. Just give me a moment. I'm trying to pull the slide. Hope the slide is visible to all. So the topic chosen for my project is scripted communication in healthcare, evaluating its impact on patient and nurse interactions and health outcomes. So this is my project team headed by Ms. Punita Singh, AVP Nursing, Healthcare Global Enterprise Limited. My mentor, Ms. Shiny Vargas, Patient Safety Fellow Cohort 1, and the rest are my team members. So we all know healthcare communication plays an important role and is an essence of patient to nurse interaction. 
clarity, empathy, active listening, cultural competence all have uh, integral part in communication. Language barrier and human emotions like joy, fear, anxiety, uh, surprise, grief can all influence communication. Interaction of predefined or scripted communication will help in us deliver error-free and stress-free messages. Why did I choose this particular QIP? There were three strong reasons why I had to choose. One is frequent feedback by consultant, complaint by patient and attendance, and error during hands-off. Along with this, we also understood the core reasons why the nurses were not able to communicate properly. One was inadequate training, experience level, attitude, user and familiarity, system failure, casual approach, working on assumptions were all the reasons or contributing factors from the nurses. Apart from this documentation issues, inconsistent hand or stressful atmosphere, noise or distraction, inadequate staffing level, inadequate supervision were all the other contributing factors from management method and the environment. So what did we uh, do to overcome this? So we created focused objective. The first being to assess the existing level of communication between patients and nurses. The second one is to assess the level of satisfaction among patient and nurses on scripted versus non-scripted spontaneous communication. Third is to evaluate the impact of scripted communication versus non-scripted spontaneous communication on specific health outcomes, especially pain management, prevention of oral mucositis, reporting signs of extravasation. So what, how did we approach? We did PDCA, in plan we developed script, in do we briefed and trained, in check we saw the readiness and in act we did implementation. So before implementing we did a pre-interventional survey questionnaire among patients to understand the satisfaction level and the report results were 50-50 percentage that is partial satisfaction of, of patient among nurses uh, communication. So uh, then we uh, went ahead to introduce the scripts and then we again conducted a satisfaction level survey to understand the nurses and the patient satisfaction on scripted communication. And we were happy to see that 95 to 92 percentage of uh, positive feedback came from the nurses and the patient using scripted communication. Along with that, we also did a comparison to understand the feedback from patient and nurses uh, on spontaneous non-scripted communication and they were actually uh, not on a positive note which gave 39 to 35 percentage of dissatisfaction uh, where they were happy uh, having a scripted rather than having a spontaneous non-scripted. Along with us, we want to assess the health outcome using scripted communication. We chose three uh, basic domains. One is self-management of pain at home where patient pain scale ranging between 9 to 5 slowly drastically started decreasing between two, three and one uh, based on the home care management. The second one was oral mucositis prevention. So based on the script and based on the strategies, uh, you know, uh, strategies taught to the patient uh, how to prevent oral mucositis, patients were able to use it more frequently and prevent oral mucositis at home. Along with us, we also saw reporting of signs of extravasation. Here again, we found patients came forward to report the early signs of extravasation to the consultants. So how did we achieve this? We did the first thing is recording of video, where the video records were given as an access, free access to all the nurses to understand and to recite this particular script and memorize it. And the second, we did the creation of scripts with the help of aided, ISPAR, and focused uh, scripts like pre-chemo, pre-surgery, consultative management, medication administration, discharge advice, transfer in and out. The rest of the pictures are our training and the uh, interview questionnaire. So way forward, what are we thinking? To bring scripted communication as a part of culture among a hospital, technology integration, linguistic adoption of local language, and employ engagement using employees to develop more local scripts. So in summary, what did we understand? Interaction of this particular script has definitely enhanced customer satisfaction and we want to sustain this uh, as an overall result and also we will be developing uh, additional scripts to handle and to address specific interactions. So given below are my references what I have used during this particular project phase. So overall, thank you so much for your patient listening and at this particular juncture, I take an opportunity to thank Annie's senior leadership team who have onboarded me to be a fellow. Along with that, I also thank Ms. Punita Singh, who is my immediate reporting manager, for giving me this opportunity of conducting to conduct this particular project in Healthcare Global Enterprise. So thank you all. Uh, that was about my project. So uh, with no further delay, probably any questions, I'll take it during a break. And with no further delay, I call Ms. Elizabeth Varki, Chief Nursing Officer, Baby Memorial Hospital, Holy Code, Kerala.
to present about her project on intra-hospital transport of patients on non-invasive ventilator. which was done as part of Patient Safety Fellowship Program. So just give me one minute so that I can pull out my presentation. Yes, so myself, Elizabeth Berkey, presently working as a Chief Nursing Officer at Baby Memorial Hospital, and I'm the cohort three in the batch of 2023 to 2025. So the title of my project is Intra-Hospital Transport of Patients on Non-Invasive Ventilators. This project was undertaken at Baby Merrill Hospital, Kodi Kod, Kerala, which is a 490-bedded hospital, uh, with Mrs. Gracie Mathai as a champion, myself as a project leader, and my mentor, Dr. Rosine Rachel. She was also the Annie Patient Safety Fellow, cohort two, and my team members, Mrs. Pisa, Tirtha, Ms. Lissy Jose, and Ms. Amrita. As you all know that, Intra-hospital transfer of critically ill patients for diagnostic as well as therapeutic procedures is a great challenge. So we know that moving patients from critically areas is associated with 70% of complications and 2% of mortality, according to the literature reviews. Transportation of such patients need careful preparation and time spent outside a controlled environment could be 30 to 90 minutes. And literature says that if we exceed more than this time limit, there is increased chance for mortality. Before transferring patients, normally we check the hemodynamic stability, the line sensitive, the medications, and the documentations. But no importance are given to the equipment which are assisted with these patients. So here comes the need for the study. So this project has been undertaken based upon the three incidents of sentinel event or the preventable sentinel event which have occurred while transferring patients on BiPAP. So in view of these occurrences of fatal complications, while transferring patients on non-invasive ventilators, the team decided to take up the quality improvement project to reduce the incidence of complications to achieve a benchmark of zero incidence. So after this incident, we have done a detailed RCA in which we identified various lacunae. We have seen that the staff were unaware, especially about the equipment or the strategies or the protocols that has to be undertaken before transferring a patient. They were unaware about the legal implications there was no check by the seniors. More time was spent outside control environment, low battery backups, and less awareness about the equipment, which have led to this sentinel event. So based upon this, we have formulated three basic objectives. The first objective was to analyze the root cause of patient desaturation during BiPAP transport, to develop and implement a standardized process to ensure patient safety and during transport, to evaluate the effectiveness of the intervention in reducing complications while transferring patients on non-invasive ventilators. So the story begins here. This project was undertaken based upon the three incidents of uh, losing three precious, precious lives. So we have done a detailed RCA in which we plan to have a rigorous checklist and staff education to see that no harm reaches to the patient while transporting. So we have come up with certain implementations like ESCORT checklist. ESCORT is an acronym and mode code is a simulated mode code in which uh, we have formed as a new teaching strategy to make staff aware about the legal implications and the precautionary tail, which also was a simulated one. And, uh, and finally, we have done the data collection. And the study analysis have come up with a very good result. So this was a mode code, which is a simulated form in which we have the judge, the advocate, and the plaintiff, and the victim was there. So the incident was properly narrated and the uh, uh, protocols that had been followed and all these checks were done. And finally, the verdict was given. So this is an innovative teaching strategy which made the staff aware about legal implications. Then we also have done a precautionary trail. This was in a two-scene process. This was also a teaching strategy in which the first scene was the process that was uh, going here in the hospital or the organization. And the second scene was exactly what has to be done. So this here we have incorporated the checklist and the staff were, were um, uh, made aware about this area. So this is the modified intra-hospital transportation instruction we call it as ESCORT. ESCORT, as I already mentioned, is an acronym. A stands for equipment, S for systematic, C for communication, O for observation, R for recent investigation, and T for team. So this improvement that we have achieved, uh, we could look to the previous years. In 2022, we had one incident of patient mortality while transporting. In 2023, we had two incidents. So here we stepped up to come up with a intervention and to 
uh, with the aim to reduce this complication. So we here we had the uh, implementation phase and the post intervention. We could identify that in 2024 there were no incidents of such fatal e events. So looking way forward, we are planning to have tremendous training, then uh, rigorous audits, and to expand this practice as well as this uh, teaching innovative strategies to other hospitals and organizations so that they can also plan and uh, follow this uh, protocols and policies and feedback we are planning to take the feedback from the patient as well as from the uh, staff uh, regarding their compliance and effectiveness of this intervention so in summary i feel that this project has addressed the problem of patient desaturation while implementing this escort checklist and by utilizing innovative teaching methodologies the staff were aware about the legal implications as well as the exact protocol that has to be followed, which have led to complete elimination of incidents. So I feel that this project have come up with good outcome as in which the staff were aware and they are practicing a good protocol while shifting patients, especially in pre-check as well as the post-check. So this could be extended to other hospitals even and uh, this could help any patient while transporting them from any critical areas. So uh, with this, uh, let me wind up and I express my sincere gratitude to all of you who have been with me throughout this project. And my special thanks to my mentor, Dr. Uh, Rosalind Rachel, as well as my great mentor, Tangam Man, for all the support that you have provided throughout this journey. And to my team who have helped me to complete this project very successfully. So once again, thank you. Thank you so much for this patient listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, and for other queries we'll be having during the break time. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. So next we would, uh, go with our next presentation on enhancing patient safety, reducing in-hospital cardiac arrest rates through quality improvement initiatives by Ms. Jyoti Mary Kanchala, who is an assistant nursing superintendent, Krishna Institute of Medical Science, Hyderabad. So probably she's not uh, available today in person. We would go with the presentation. A proud member of ANEI and Patient Safety Fellowship Program Cohort 3. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to ANEI and Patient Safety Movement Foundation for giving me this opportunity to present my QIP. Give me a moment to pull up my slide. My QIP is on enhancing patient safety, reducing in-hospital cardiac arrest through quality improvement initiatives. This project was conducted at Krishna Institute of Medical Sciences. My project champion was Mrs. Harita Vijayan, project lead myself. My mentor was Mrs. Shita Chanda and team members as you see on the screen. Objectives of my QIP to implement MU scoring for early identification of patient deterioration, to apply evidence-based multimodal interventions for preventing in-hospital cardiac arrest, to reduce the number of cardiac arrest to less than 50% of the current number. In-hospital cardiac arrests are common and are associated with high mortality rate. The occurrences are more in the ward when compared to the other departments of the hospital. Prevention is the first link in the chain of survival for in-hospital cardiac arrest. And these are very much identified out of ICUs. We have seen in our hospital that we had on an average five code blues per month, which were very much preventable if at-risk patients were identified at an early stage by use of early warning scores and other parameters. Over a period of five months, we had RRT calls ranging between 44 to 63 and code blues between 3 to 7. This is why the team felt that we have to take up this QIP in reducing the in-hospital cardiac arrest. We have adopted a PDSA methodology where we audited all codes by review of case sheets and the code blue running sheets, systemic review of literature, reformation of RRT and training modules for staff we also did our RCA, train staff and MUSE, and ensure usage of technology to monitor vitals, introduced debriefing of every code, modified the critical care transfer criteria, and empower RRT. 
Further, the data was analyzed with the help of post-code debriefing. We ensured the staff had continuous training on MUSE and use of the CVM for all patients and ensure for time, timely escalation of any deteriorating patients. The root cause analysis revealed that there was lack of escalation by nurses regarding the worsening patients. However, there were also gaps in assessment by the RRT. Most of the time, nurses missed to check the respiratory rate. Though we had technology wherein we could check the MUSE and continuously monitor the patient's vitals, it was underutilized. Also, patients with more, MUSE more than three were kept in the wards. And we also found that there were a lot of gaps with the rapid response team and the resources which were available were underutilized. We have analyzed about 24 code blues during a period of five months. We have seen that code blues were seen mostly among patients with, with age group between 61 to 80. And these patients were belonging to medical oncology followed by nephrology. The major reason for code blue was desaturation followed by unresponsiveness. And these patients muse was ranging between two to six. The survival rate was about 67%. We have devised these interventions in order to reduce the number of codes. We have reformed the existing rapid response team and empowered them. We conducted training for all the stakeholders on resuscitative courses, MUSE, case-based instant training, rash cart management, and use of defibrillator. We also used technology for monitoring vitals and ensure timely escalation. We introduced post-code debriefing, introduced modified transfer out criteria for critical care patients. This is the progress of our QIP. We could see a reduction in the number of codes to three, and the RRT calls were increased from 44 to 72. Post-implementation, between April to July, we had around 12 codes. Out of those 12, Patients between 61 to 80 years of age group were having the arrest and this was seen among the nephrology patients mostly. And the major region, reason for this code was hypoglycemia followed by unresponsiveness. Patients with MU score of 3 were having the arrest. However, the survival rates increased compared to the pre-implementation phase to 75%. My way forward is to have 100% utilization of technology for vitals monitoring. We will further deep dive into nephrology related code blue events, simulation based training for nurses, a target of zero code blues out of CCUs. To summarize my QIP, in hospital cardiac arrests are preventable. Use of modified early warning signs, increased awareness among nurses and the RRT with regard to optimizing the clinical care will help to identify the worsening patients references as you see on the screen. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Madam Tankam for her valuable guidance throughout my journey. My sincere thanks to my mentor Mrs. Ishita Chanda for mentoring me throughout my QIP. Thank you so much. Namaste. Thank you. Uh, so I guess it's Problem is same, but approaches are very different. I'm sure that uh, fellows have understood the need of conducting a QIP. So calling the next Ms. K. S. Neetu, Nursing Superintendent, Quality and Digitalization, Rajagiri Hospitals, Kochi, to present on the topic and the project is healing, reduction of happy and improvement in patient care in early stages of pressure injury as a process of systemic improvement. Thank you, very good evening to everyone. Sorry, good afternoon. <laughs> yes, Neetu, I'm working as nursing superintendent for quality and digitalization in Rajagiri Hospital at Kerala, India. Today I'm here as any patient safety fellowship program representing.
Assistant Superintendent for Quality and Digitalization in Rajagiri Hospital at Kerala, India. Today I'm here as any patient safety fellowship program representing the batch 2325 as cohort 3. Before proceeding to our MS UIP, I just wanted to give my gratitude to the organizer and the team. I'm profoundly honored to participate in this fellowship program with Patient Safety Moment Foundation and Association of Nurse Executives India. My sincere thanks to Dr. Michael Ramsey for providing the invaluable platform for us to advance our knowledge in patient safety. My sincere thanks to Ms. Tangam Gomez for her exceptional guidance. I also uh, extend my heartfelt gratitude to my mentor, Ms. Sojanya Keska. Today we are talking about the Quality Improvement Project HELA, the reduction of hospital acquired pressure injury and the improvement in patient safety care in identifying the pressure injuries at early stage. Before proceeding to the few, I just wanted to put some light on, my, on the background of the topic. As we know that happy is a significant global concern and millions of patients are getting admitted and getting affected in the hospital, which leads them to uh, extend their hospital stay, higher health cost. These impact are uh, even though highlights that it is an urgent need for effective prevention and management and the strategies are important. Despite of medical advancements, still we are having this struggle. This is a critical challenge for each and everybody who is having tertiary care hospitals. The importance is to do some kind of a research and develop some strategies to improve further, which in Rajagiri we identified and we are practicing evidence-based practice to apply the better care and outcome. Moving towards the problem statement, we have uh, identified there was like high incidence rate which was reporting to be 0.67 per 1000 days due to the long duration of surgery and the prolonged bed return patients. There was inappropriate risk assessments were also identified as a score of 55%. Only the compliance was 55% and in knowledge scoring when it comes to related to risk identification of patients, preventing the pressure injury was 60%. When we went to the deep down and identified the causes with the help of parental chart, it is identified that 80% cause of our happy was the three major reasons. The long heart surgery which was contributing 31%, restrictive mobilization 26% and gaps in effective nursing care was 21%. This is my project team. Coming to the objective, the major focus of our was reducing the pressure injuries with the benchmark which was internal benchmark with the uh, reference of NPIAP which is 3 point, 0 0.36 per 1,000 IP days. Enhancing the knowledge of nurses so which, with the target of 90% where we are definitely going to focus on their assessment, prevention and management and accuracy of identifying the high risk patients to improve by 90%. As we can see, the story of happy was a, a very happy story actually to the patient and to the organization as well. As per my uh, concerns I discussed in my RCA, there was a long heart surgery which is 31% where we identified there was a required the replacement of OT support devices. We also uh, done a prophylactic dressing application where we know that the patient's surgery will long last more than 4 hours. We also taken up the uh, one of the initiative of applying a tool which is called Scott Trigger where pre-op patients has been identified for the risk to developing a pressure injury within 72 hours. Coming to restricted mobilization where we have seen that patient needs a pressure relieving mattress on the basis of the weight of the patient, we focused on applying those mattresses. Also we focused on asking bundle that is management bundle where the risk of the patient is identified, skin assessment is done with the help of bread and skin, surface is being checked, kept with the patient uh, uh, changing positions, like in the early incontinence and moisture is controlled. The nutrition and hydration of the patient is maintained and giving information and getting the help from patient also involving patient and patient bystander for the care. Pressure injury protocol released and implemented at the bedside. When it comes to gaps in nursing care, we need that, uh, yeah, there is a specialist nurses required where we introduce our tissue viability nurses who are the specialists certified for the particular process. Where they are focusing on the training and implementation of these managements, policy was revised, privilege audits first done and prepared the care path before the nurses to take a help to manage the patient at bedside. As per the other initiative, we also introduced the quality and uh, different sizes of dressings for the different pressure areas. In the rate of orders of pressure injury risk assessment tool also implemented at the bedside. Uh, these are the few glimpses of our uh, actions uh, and uh, uh, the initiative which is applied at the bedside. Improvement, yes, we have achieved a 62% improvement where we are supposed to get the level, uh, lowering, uh, lowering our uh, rates by 0.36 where we got it to 0.25 per thousand IP days. We also got an improvement in 
36% improvement in knowledge of nurses. Harris identification was improved to 44% and there was a patient satisfaction improvement also. Of course, the success story, the happy picture of happy. So this is few glimpses of those pictures. I can't share everything. Yes, of course, but there are few uh, which we have actually achieved. So coming to the way forward, we know that quality is not a destination, it's a journey. It is always need to go around. And also we are raising our bars with that and we are implementing this process in completely in all uh, area of the hospital, focusing on OT procedures. Also making sure that the risk assessments are regularly done and checked and utilize the happy management protocol. And also we are planning to develop a management protocol care pathway for the further management of the patient which we are identified. Coming to the summarizing my QIP, as we know, this project was illuminated our pathway, path for the forwarding the patient care and preventing the pressure injuries in our patients. It was also played a very favorite uh, method for us to targeting on interventions underlying the commitment to raising the standards for care for the critically ill patients. Of course, uh, uh, with the, uh, I just wanted to conclude my topic with saying that we are committed to patient safety and we are because of our patients. But yes, this opportunity of being a patient safety fellow made me to realize that this, this is definitely a game changer for my practices as well, because the extensive knowledge and the expertise which is imparted during our uh, discussions with different fellows of different areas, different hospital, different regions, it has been very instrumental for me to understand different opinions actually help us to give a better guidelines. So thank you so much for all the fellows around there and Patient Safety Movement Foundation as well as Annie for being a, an instrumental for my practices in my hospital. Definitely I'm looking forward to apply all the good guidelines which I got from the study. Thank you so much signing off me. Uh, thank you so much Hello, for patients everyone. listening. Oh. Okay, so I love to take the questions later in the time when we are getting the break. Thank you so much. Thanks for that wonderful recording. Okay, next we have our next patient safety fellow, Ms. Karishma, Assistant Nursing Superintendent, Apollo Hospitals, Gauhati, Assam, to present on the project, a quality improvement project to identify hypoglycemic events and reduce adverse events through a standardized protocol. Good afternoon, everyone. Namaste, everyone. It's a great privilege to be here at fourth annual patient safety conference by any to present our quality improvement projects. Kindly allow me to share my presentations. Myself, Ms. Karishma Khan, and I'm proud to be any patient safety fellowship program in 2023 to 2025. As a proud cohort three, we have taken a quality improvement project to identify hypoglycemia and reducing and perseverance through standardized protocol. To introduce the topic, as we all know, hypoglycemia is a very, very common event in hospital settings and patients with or without diabetes may experience this serious cause of fatality. Many episodes of hypoglycemia among patients are preventable. Therefore, a standardized, standardized protocol is much needed and it should be adopted and implemented by each hospital and hospital system. Project title was a quality improvement project to identify events of hypoglycemia and preventing adverse events through a standardized protocol. Why we thought of taking this project is, it is a serious patient safety concern as it leads to mortality and morbidity. Nurses face various issues to clinically manage the patient whenever hypoglycemia events occur. There were 38 events has seen from October 2023 to April 2024. There was also missed dose of anti-diabetic medications for pre-operative patients. Modification of correct diet in hospital information system was an issue. Knowledge on prevention and management of hypoglycemia among healthcare providers is utmost important and there was lack of in-depth knowledge in in identifying and managing hypoglycemia. With this, we have formulated our project team at Apollo Hospital, Gohati Assam. Myself was a champion. Ms. Pinaki Bayan, Chief Nursing Officer, was a project lead. Dr. Vijaya Thangam was my mentor. Team members were Ms. B. S. Donaring Anal, Ms. Sangita Paul, Ms. Medusmita Pathak, and Ms. Bernalit Chaudhary. 
Our objectives were to identify the events of hypoglycemia to assess the compliance of blood sugar monitoring, develop and implement a standardized hypoglycemia prevention and management protocol, assess the number of hypoglycemia and way of managing it post implementation. We have adopted a PDCA methodology. In plan, we have formulated a team, identified the hypoglycemia events. Data collection tool is developed. Leadership team was involved to, and issues were raised in GTC and quality safety meeting. Detailed discussion were carried out with HOD laboratory for pure city meter quality check. In those days, we have carried out the audit process. Training sessions were conducted. Diabetic certification course was developed and implemented. We have created hypoglycemia algorithm as well as implemented it. There was modification done in insulin sliding scales. Customization of food tray were done as per the colors. Types of insulin were made to in a chart and displayed in all the inpatient areas. In check phases, we have done continuous monitoring and process check for blood sugar monitoring compliances. We have reviewed all the four DLO cases to identify hypoglycemia events. Knowledge check of staff nurses were also done. In act. This is as a, as a high risk process for continuous audit uh, process. In service education is in place. Reward and recognition program for people who has identified hypoglycemia on time and preventing severe hypoglycemia events and prompt response in managing the hypoglycemia. In background, we have checked the compliances on blood sugar monitoring in different parameters like blood sugar order was there or not for checking. It is checked as per the order or not. Sliding scales was followed or not, documentation on independent double check uh, verification were there or not, was there any documentation of intake of food as it is very, very important in nurses notes, awareness on critical level, etc, etc. We have also taken help from our endocrinologist to review our diabetic course module and also hospital leadership team was involved for zero billing of patients while checking for POCT quality check. In implementation phases, training were carried out uh, through classroom training, on-job training, etc. Also, diabetic course, certification course module were carried out. Hypoglycemia algorithm was uh, developed and it was displayed in all the inpatient area for easy reference. Display of type of insulin chart near and above the face so that nurses become sensitized and stimulated that what type of insulin they're going to administer. We have also added this point in the nursing empowerment policy. We have added glucon D in 100% in press talk after getting approval from GTC meetings. Few glimpses of training where we have also involved our consultants. Two batches were completed for the certification course. Each batch had 15 number of nurses. We have achieved our improvement in and compliance to blood sugar monitoring in all the parameters as we have seen. And we have seen eight numbers of hypoglycemia in three months where 36% of patients have used injection dextrose and 64% of patients have used glucon D while identifying hypoglycemia. Way forward, we are going to continue this audit process. Continuous in-service education is in place as well as this has been added in the nursing induction program. We have a plan to complete diabetic certification course for 100% nurses. We are also thinking of creating a diabetic nurse. Inclusion of blood sugar level in news format, creation of a standardized patient family education content so that everybody speaks the same language. To summarize, hypoglycemia in healthcare settings are very, very common and it should be considered as one of the high risk process. Continuous training, reinforcement, and following standardized protocol will definitely help in avoidable patient harm. These are my reference. Thank you so much. I would like to share my gratitude to Annie for creating this platform for us. I would like to share my heartfelt gratitude with Sangam Ma'am for supporting us, guiding us, mentoring us throughout this uh, Patient Safety Fellowship Program. And last but not the least, Vijaya Ma'am for mentoring and being with us for uh, all the time through this project. And last, again, to my institution and to my project team. Thank you once again. Thank you for patient listening. would like to discuss in the break time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hope we are all now hyperglycemic. Too much of information, right? Too much of best practices done. So next, I would call Ms. Krishna Chaudhary, Vice Principal, come Associate Professor, Mathura Nath Memorial Nursing Institute, West Bengal, to present the topic on improving first hour breastfeeding initiation rate among healthy newborns. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Krishna Chaudhary and I am a patient safety fellow under Association of Nurse Executives India. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Association of Nurse Executives India for providing me this wonderful opportunity to present my quality improvement project in front of this esteemed forum. 
I also want to thank my mentor, Mrs. Chita Chandraman and the team of Varsha Hospital who helped me uh, while conducting the quality improvement project. Now, uh, kindly give me few seconds to share my slides. So the title of my project is Improving First Hour Breastfeeding Rate Among the Healthy Newborns. Why I have uh, chosen this uh, uh, topic is that early institution of breastfeeding within the 30 minutes of delivery is one of the crucial things because the cholesterol gets transferred from the mother's breast to the baby and it helps in uh, reducing the neonatal mortality because it provides um, immunity to the baby. So this guideline has been given by WHO, UNICEF and breastfeeding hospital initiatives, breastfeeding friendly hospital initiative that we have to start the early, uh, start the breastfeeding within 30 minutes of birth. And the National Code of India is to increase the rate of early initiation of breastfeeding to 90% by the year 2025. So the hospital where I have conducted the quality improvement project is Varsha Hospital of Falakata. The champion is Dr. Shubhita Hunter. I am leading the project. My mentor is Mrs. Ichita Chandra and these are my team members. So when I was doing the baseline data analysis, uh, the uh, rate of initiation of first hourly breastfeeding was 8% and uh, we have decided to increase this to 80% among the postpartum mother mothers but there is a criteria that the babies need to be uh, 35 weeks old or older than that and they should be hemodynamically stable and the babies can be born by both normal delivery and cesarean delivery. So the objectives of my study are to determine the rate of initiation of breastfeeding within first hour of delivery among the healthy newborns. Second one is to find out the factors associated with initiation of delayed breastfeeding and the third one is to develop an uh, instructional model to educate the staff regarding importance of initiation of breastfeeding uh, within first hour. Uh, so this is the institutional baseline data that here we have seen that in the month of April 2024 only 8% have initiated breastfeeding within one hour and 64% has not even initiated. There are various uh, uh, factors which lead to delay in breastfeeding and we have done a root cause analysis where we have found that there are presence of male relatives in the world which leads to intrusion of privacy in the mothers. There is less in initiatives taken by the staff and there is lack of proper guidance from the individual period uh, itself from the staff nurses and the mothers are not well aware regarding the lactation management. There is excessive workload of the staff and here is a protocol that after the baby is born they are immediately shifted to the baby rooms and there is provision of provision of formula feeds in the baby room and there is also proper uh, like lacking of proper documentation of the time of initiation of breastfeeding which leads to delayed in breastfeeding so we have initiated an initiated action plan in that regard. So in the planning phase, we have planned for staff training, a protocol creation regarding breastfeeding and doc proper documentation. So in the due phase, we have conducted regular training sessions for the staff and we have uh, implemented the breastfeeding protocol. In study, we have done the data analysis and the results are compared with the baseline data. And uh, in the act phase, we have implemented the protocol as a standard criteria in the labor room and the OT. We have continued staff education program and the hospital has planned for a breastfeeding friendly hospital initiative accreditation. So this is a knowledge level where we have found that um, after the training program, 44% of the staff nurses uh, has gained adequate knowledge. These are the observation of breastfeeding practices and these practices are assessed in various criteria, various parameters has been uh, assessed. So in the readiness of mother and baby, we have seen that 76% of the staff nurses uh, has made the mother comfortable, whereas 64% of the staff nurses has checked the baby's health and readiness for breastfeeding. In the environmental uh, parameter, we have seen that 76% of the staff nurses has provided a warm and quiet environment to the mother, and 68% of the staff nurses has ensured privacy for both the mother and baby. Whereas in hygiene, we have seen that 72% of the uh, staff nurses has performed hand hygiene before, and hand before handling the baby. Uh, in the skin contact, we have seen that 60% of the staff nurses has placed the mother, uh, baby on the mother's chest immediately after birth. 72% of the staff nurses has uh, continued skin to skin contact and zooming in. In mother baby bonding, we have seen that 72% of the staff nurses uh, has uh, given uninterrupted bonding time for the mother and baby, and 56% of the staff nurses have delayed the unnecessary interventions. In positioning, we have seen that 80% of the staff nurses has assisted the mother in positioning the baby in the mother's breast, and 84% of the uh, staff nurses has um, shown the baby uh, mother how to align the baby in the mother's chest. 
Uh, in the Lechman technique, we have seen that 76% of the staff nurses has helped them order to achieve a good Lechim, uh, Lechimon technique and 84% of the staff nurses, they are aware about, about the science of effective Lechimon. Uh, in encouragement, we have seen that 64% of the staff nurses has provided verbal encouragement to the mother and 76% of the staff nurses has given guidance to the mother. In monitoring baby's response parameter, we have seen that 76% of the staff nurses has observed for the signs of effective breastfeeding and 60% of the staff nurses has monitored the baby for uh, distress and difficulties in breastfeeding. Whereas in documentation, we have uh, seen that 76% uh, of the staff nurses has maintained the record at the time and birth and initiation of breastfeeding. and uh, 88% of the staff nurses, uh, they have recorded the duration and effectiveness of the first breastfeeding session. Uh, in mother's well-being, we have seen that 80% of the staff nurses has uh, provided comfort to the mother. In the comparison, we have seen that in April 2024, the rate was 8%, whereas after three cycles of PTSA, in the end of uh, July 2024, 76% of the mothers has initiated first hourly breastfeeding. So the way forward are immediate skin-to-skin -skin contact after birth, uh, rooming in practices need to be followed, uh, staff training on lactation management, it should be sustained, and accreditation of the hospital by the breastfeeding by the hospital initiative. In summary, I'd like to tell that sustaining staff education and implementing the breastfeeding guidelines laid down by breastfeeding friendly hospital initiative will help India to fulfill the national goal of improving the first hourly initiation rate of breastfeeding by 90% within 2024. So these are my references. Thank you so much everyone for providing me this wonderful opportunity and thank you for your patient consent. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, if any queries are there, we will be addressing it in the break time. Thank you so much. A wonderful QIP again. Okay, so heading to our Colonel Madam, Amita Nazi, Nursing Superintendent, Sri Narayana Institute of Medical Science, Kerala, to present on effectiveness of nurse managed intervention to prevent hypoglycemia among hospitalized patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Good afternoon, all. Hello everyone, Namaste. I'm Lieutenant General Amita Naze, a proud patient safety fellow of COCO3, and I'm here to present my quality improvement project. Before that, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to AMEI and Patient Safety Movement Foundation for this golden opportunity. A special thanks to Tangam Ma'am and my mentor, Ms. Purva Das, and all fellow project members for their unwavering support. Thank you all. To begin the project, I would like to share my style slides. Just a moment. Patients admitted in hospitals with type 2 diabetes mellitus are susceptible to hypoglycemia. Nurses are on the front line of diabetes management in hospitals. Timely intervention of nurses along with patient education can definitely reduce the risk of hypoglycemia with their hospital admission. Hypoglycemia is a fall in blood sugar to levels below normal, typically below 70 mg per deciliter. It can be mild, moderate, and severe. This is a project team which is organized in Srinagar Institute of Medical Science and Nagar with its project members. The title of the study is Effectiveness of Nurse Managed Interventions to Prevent Hypoglycemia Among Hospitalized Patients with Type 2 DM. Due to the increasing monthly incident of hypoglycemia, the team has initiated a project. Objectives is to assess the effectiveness of a nurse managed intervention to prevent hypoglycemia, to identify the related factors of hypoglycemia, and to investigate the translation of nurses' knowledge into practice. A fishbone method was used for the root cause analysis in which we have patient-related factors, provider-related factors, and treatment-related factors. In patient-related factors, we have socioeconomic, clinical factors, lack of knowledge, irregular medication, and irregular follow. In provider-related factors, we have lack of knowledge, improper technique, and treatment-related factors are treatment regime. This is the PDSA cycle to improve the process. When team was formed, a pre edit audit was done to identify the gap and questioners were developed teaching modules for the patients and bystanders and teaching modules for staff was done. 
root cause analysis was done and uh, training modules was done. Staff were trained, patient assessment was done through questionnaires, GRBs tracking and uh, patient and bystander teaching sessions. Data analysis was done and post audit done. Staff training, post close monitoring and early detection of warning signs, teaching modules for patient bystanders and smileless bar for communication was done. This is the nurse managed intervention process map in, in which the pre-audit was done by tracking of monthly incidents of hypoglycemia. Nurse-led intervention was uh, uh, done by staff training program and patient education program. After that, analysis and interpretation was done. Smileless bar, that is, if you are conversing with a doctor regarding a hypoglycemic patient, a smile can be applied as smile, S is equal to sugar trend, M for medication, I for IV fluids, L for lab results, E for eating pattern or diet. GRBS monitoring, early recognition, rapid response was also followed, and tracking of incident was continued. Root cause analysis was histone analysis and data collection was done by question. This is the question that addresses the knowledge of the uh, staff where you can see uh, there is a tremendous increase in knowledge after the post test, uh, after the training, you can see. Here also, we can see uh, increase in knowledge after the training. So, Good knowledge has increased from 42.7% to 80.7%. This is a patient assessment questionnaire where we can see in socioeconomic data, patients are above 50 years and they are living in rural area. Also, we can see in clinical data, multiple patients with multiple comorbidities and duration of type, type 2 DM more than 10 years. Further analysis, we can see that a poor doctor's consultation and self-adjustment of medication can also be seen. Also, poor diet control and history of hypoglycemia in the past six months can be seen. So, training module for staff was uh, prepared. Uh, smile as bar for hand of communication was strictly followed. We emphasized on early recognition and management to diabetic chart and standing model for the management of hypoglycemia. Teaching module for the patients and bystander was also done. This is the improvement which, which we have achieved from the month of February 2024 to August 2024 from 11.11% 11 .11 to 1.5%. This is the inpatient hypoglycemic rate that is from September to February where there was a tremendous increase in the hypoglycemic rates and where we have started our uh, uh, project in the month of February and we can see a decline in hypoglycemic rate from 11.11% to 1.5%. So take home message is that to prevent hypoglycemia, we can uh, train the staff regularly. We can give effective bedside hand of communication to smile as far, prompt tracking of incidents, timely reporting of symptoms, early recognition and prop management, ongoing teaching sessions of patients and bystanders, and ensuring teach back policy at the time of discharge. This is the tracking of community settings. This is the incidental finding which we have attained while tracking the patient for follow. -up. What we have obtained is a decline in hypoglycemia, not only in the hospital settings, we can also see a reduce in hypoglycemia in the community also. So summarize, patients above 50 years in a rural area of residence with multiple comorbidities and long-term diabetes more than 10 years, poor knowledge and improper technique were found to be the related factors of hypoglycemia. Nurse managed interventions, patients teaching program, regular staff training sessions, all are uh, the factors which have reduced the incidence from 11.11% .11 to 1.5%. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you. And any questions can be taken in the break time. Thank you. More than the QIPs, you know, the different varieties of fishes are attracting me, actually. You know, two different varieties. Let's watch what is the next person having on the plate. So uh, to call the next person is Pratyusha Chaudhary, Deputy General Manager of Nursing Education and Training, Ashoda Group of Hospitals, Hyderabad. 
should be presenting on implementing and evaluating a standardized patient identification process to reduce errors and enhance patient safety within the healthcare facility. Thank you, everyone. Uh, how many of you know the IPSG goal one? Can you be louder for that? Uh, it's not identify the patient, but it is identifying the patient correctly. <laughs> Let's see my presentation. Namaste to all the eminent leaders gathered here. I'm Pratisha Chaudhary, working as Assistant General Manager at Ashoka Hospitals, Hyderabad. Firstly, I would like to thank the CEO of Patient Safety Movement, Dr. R Michael Ram Singh, who is a visionary leader leading us towards zero harm by 2030. And I would like to thank our Lady Hulk and our inspiration for many, our Thanika ma'am, for her enormous support and constant motivation for Kohar Team Annie Patient Safety Fellowship program. I also thank the ANI committee members for providing this uh, opportunity to be an ounce of change makers in India. I also thank my guru, Dr. Amar, and also uh, our uh, GM, Vimala Prasad ma'am, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to join this cohort. I also thank uh, my wonderful mentor, doc, uh, Dr. Vinod Kumar for, from cohort one. Let me pull my presentation for you today. My QIP is on implementing and evaluating the standard patient, say, patient identification process to reduce errors and enhance patient safety within the healthcare facility. Here is our uh, project team members. Actually, the hospital's high-tech city is a place where we did our QIP. It is a 3,000 bedded hospital where we have uh, functional beds of 500 right now. And this is our wonderful team members. Accuracy in patient identification is not just a process. It is a fundamental pillar of patient safety and quality care. When we wanted to initiate why this only patient safety identification process, then we thought, what is the background of it? New hospital, and it, we thought like there are too many new nurses and other healthcare facility team members where there are there is a lack of knowledge and uh, understanding of standard process. And we thought we have popping up of 20 to 30 percent of identification errors every day and in most of the procedures. No standardized process was being de designed, even though there are traditional methods in place, like we have our wristbands, different colors of um, ID bands, but still lack of awareness. And the most vital thing, behavioral and attitude problems. And there is a big resistance to change whenever we come up with some new thing. And then we thought like, we have to go ahead with this project called Project Pahachan where we want to implement and evaluate the standard patient identification process in the areas of patient uh, emergencies and admission areas. From the admission till the discharge, we want our patient to have a safety culture in our facility, diagnostics, critical lab reports, carrying the case sheets during medication administration and blood transfusions. This we made it mandate. And before do, uh, doing this project, Pehchan, we thought like, what is the root cause analysis? What are the main things that we are missing on? Then we thought lack of training on specialized things like patient identification. Patient room numbers are being used and bed numbers are being used instead of patient name and a patient identification. Resistance to change, distractions during their shift changes and during their handing off procedures or sign off procedures. Lack of standardization among the multiple departments have been identified. Then we thought we need to have certain objectives of identifying and addressing the barriers, implementing the new protocol, evaluating its effectiveness and analyzing the impact on patient safety and care culture. And we have followed PDSA model where we have come up with standardized patient identification process. In patient room surveys, we have done from patient to patient and we thought like where exactly we are going wrong. And we have interviewed the uh, patients, also the nurses, and we thought like where the training gaps are being done and we have developed our SOP where we have analyzed the challenge even though we have developed the standard process. We understood there's some gap between this and we connected these dots from one to another and we made that our team will definitely adhere with the behavioral and attitude problems and we involved leaders to enhance this and we made cer certain rewards and uh, in place so that people will start following this and we have a Sahi Pahachan. 
we made a three step process uh, which is quite easy check ask and confirm verify two patient identifiers verbal confirmation from the patient and id band verification to match the details what the patient have told us and these are the different color bands which we use in our facility and this is a conceptual framework which mainly uh, adds on the three main pillars patient and family healthcare professionals and managers where the core is about patient identification safety this is the audit checklist which we have used to identify and once we started beginning our project so we have seen a drastical change from 63 percentage to 80 to 92 percentage where we have begun two cycles or two phases of uh, clinical survey and patient identification process have been had a great compliance after the two phases and now we are in a state of third phase and this is the pre and post awareness before it was 29% in their knowledge assessment and 98% we would able to achieve after the training sessions too and what are the improvements that exactly made us to be really really happy and where uh, before starting the misidentification rates were even 72% out of our surprise even though it seems simple but sahi pehchan made us to understand that we could able to uh, come down by 20% and in a second cycle we have made it from 20% to 8% and now we are there on a process of adherence to the new process of 93% and we are really happy for this and towards this we wanted to also go ahead with sustenance plans in place where we want all the leaders to get an enhanced uh, understanding about all of this and sahi pehchan awards for making the champions and link nurses and uh, we also wanted to have other healthcare team members to this continuous education improving leaders for enhanced patient safety culture because culture is everything in a care facility and we are in a process of uh, doing a patient facing prevalence audits where it is coming up in the action plan for phase 3 in the pdsa model which involves all the other healthcare team members too and whenever we thought think about patient identification it seems so simple but sahi pehchan sounds simple but make an enormous impact on patient lives once again i thank my team and let's continue to practice a zero harm by 2030 and be the change makers and the healthcare team members thank you. so improve the sahi pehchan right identification of the
knowledge to identify the stages of pressure injuries pre analysis we observe that 65% uh, are not having adequate knowledge uh, to identify the stages of pressure injuries but after the intervention post analysis we observe that 98% uh, staff nurses are having adequate knowledge for the pressure injuries to identify the stages of pressure injuries clinical staff attitude towards the pressure injuries this chart shows that uh, pre analysis uh, 14% staff nurses are having uh, a positive attitude towards the pressure ulcer prevention but after the intervention 60% staff nurses are having the positive attitude towards the pressure ulcer prevention the incidence of pressure injuries this project was initiated september 2023 and the uh, beginning of the uh, and april 2024 the project was initiated and the project uh, was uh, intervention was started and then what data was collected uh, till august 2024 so here we observe that 30% of uh, uh, cases were there and in uh, uh, august 2020 after beginning the project the cases reduced 3% despite of numerous uh, numerous obstacle we have successfully reduced the incidence of pressure injuries from 30% to the 3% and 60% healthcare team member have, have had the positive attitude towards the pressure injuries the improvement achieved through this project staff training uh, was done brief and debriefing session was done and uh, practiced standardized assessment tool implemented the chart of pressure areas award to the champions and recognition uh, recognition at the unit level way forward reinforcement training session to reduce the incidence of pressure injuries maintain the same strategy in the upcoming month conduct the regular interdisciplinary rounds and audit and establish a specialized wound care department the pressure injury prevention represent a marker of quality of life through this project patient were satisfied which reduced hospital stay hospital cost and improved the family satisfaction also and healthcare team member become more confident successful satisfied with their care contributing to improve mental health these are the some reference for conducting this quality improvement project thank you everyone that i could share within 7 minutes of my quality improvement uh, project presentation and thank you any have a good day thank you i would love to take the question during the break time thank you ma'am thank you uh, my co fellows thanks for that lovely qip what you have done now over to tangam ma'am for the next proceeding hello did you learn something yes. if you learned one thing please raise your hands they learned more more than one thing okay con congratulations thank you uh, team can we have dr michael on the screen please hello sir thank you so much for at this you know early hours you are still awake and i hope uh, you have few words to tell to our fellows can you hear us sir dr michael can you hear me thank you ma i can't hear you properly can the, you hear me now this will wait is breaking up can you hear me hello technological glitch when we want to use technology they will not support you now sign language can you hear me now sir yes now i can oh thank you thank you so much sir we are just waiting for you to say few words after you had your you, you have gone through the projects before we give the yeah. certificates thank you very much sir Sure. I, I thought the projects were all very good. Um, there were two on hypoglycemia, two on pressure sores, pressure injuries. Um, the 
the one that bothered me most, and I think is probably the most important, was the failure to identify patients um, from the nurses. If, if that's a problem, then the, the group who did that study fixed the problem. Um, and uh, but that's absolutely um, vital that the patients know the nurses know they've got the right patient for the right procedure um, or the right drug. But they were all very well carried out, and I'm very impressed with them all. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And please give a big hand to all the fellows. May I request all the fellows to come on the stage to have a group photo. Please don't highlight me. You don't need. I just need Dr. Michael on the stage. Only Dr. Michael. We are going to take a group photo with you at the back. Sir, please highlight okay. Dr. Michael only. May I also request our president, Captain Ajita, missing in action. Ah, you're there. OK. I think uh, Dr. Vinci, are you there? Or she just stepped out? Congratulations to the cohort three, and they will be graduating in their big style in Anicon, during Anicon in Kochi in 2025. You will all come to Kochi? Fantastic. Great. So, sir, with your permission, I'm going to share the certificates that needs to be given to the next cohort. You are not graduating. Sorry, eh? Next year, you will graduate. This time it is cohort two. Can we have the slides? That is going to Miss Kavita Jay Prakash. She had completed her, you know, fellowship, and now she is sitting in UK. Kavita, if you are online, congratulations. Next, Miss Lata US, please come on the stage. Congratulations for completing the Annie Patient Safety Fellowship. Next. Ms. Purba Das, she's not here. Congratulations, she's from West Bengal. And uh, whoever is from Bengal, you can tell her her certificate was displayed. Next. Ms. Ramya Essen. They will definitely clap more uh, for Ramya and... <laughs> okay, next. Dr. Rosalind Rachel, I mean, she has led the path for senior people joining the fellowship program. And you'll be surprised that this year we have very senior people joining the fellowship program. So the youngsters were saying, oh, we were lucky, we got in early. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Roslin. And we have Ms. Saujanya Kesra. We have her here. Please come on the stage. Thank you for joining us today. That is the last of our fellowship uh, participants, all of them graduating. Please, Ajita, join us for a photo. And we miss the people who are not here in person. Yeah, sorry. Everybody wants sir at the background when we are taking photo. <laughs> Thank you so much and congratulations and everybody feel so proud to be, you know, recognized in front of you and clapping for them. Thank you so much, sir. And now it gives me immense pleasure to introduce the next cohort, Annie Patient Safety Fellows. They are in front of you. 
And not all of them are here. It is Dr. Geeta Parvan, the Dean Faculty Nursing from Swami Vivekananda Subharthi University, Meerut. We have Ms. Margaret Roy Gauridath, Nursing Consultant Indoor MP. She is also one of the Annie Executive Committee member. She is also the President of MP Chapter. So isn't it heartening to see that senior people, they want to do the fellowship. That's really great. Dr. Shubhangi Jadav, nursing head matron from MGM Hospital, Maharashtra. Dr. Davinder Kaur, principal, Gyan Sagar College of Nursing, Patiala, Punjab. We have Anuradha Bhatta, Bhatta AGM Nursing, AIG Hospital, Hyderabad. We have Swarnalata Patro from Orissa, assistant nursing superintendent. And this is our first entry from the government sector. Mr. B. Tangaraj, NABH coordinator, AIMS, Nagpur. So uh, these are all the signs that patient safety is becoming prevalent, more popular, nurses care, and we are becoming the soldiers and the guardian angels. So we, you are the only one, please come on the stage. <laughs> Don't miss the chance to take a photo with Dr. Michael at the back. <laughs> Sir, we have only one person in person. The rest are all watching. So we are taking a photo with you. So I'm going to ask um, our president, Ajita, to say a few words of gratitude to, to Sir Michael Ramsey. If I say I may become very emotional looking at his passion for patient safety. Um, I only want to express my sincere gratitude and obligation to you, uh, Dr. Michael Ramsey. Uh, you, you know, when, when we f become tired or fed up with running the game, I think of you you at 4 a.m. at your place and uh, being live with us is, uh, is such an emotional thing for us, your commitment uh, to patient safety. Uh, I would request all of you actually to visit the website of uh, Patient Safety Movement Foundation, uh, very active website they have and they have a free membership as well. Uh, so there are paid membership too. So I would request all of you to visit the site and especially here the patient, patients who are talking about who suffered harm uh, in, in the hands of healthcare workers and uh, in US uh, it has uh, taken a lot ahead where people talk without fear uh, and uh, the people who are hearing also hear them out without judgment. Uh, judging the healthcare workers and also the patients. So we have a long way to go and uh, sir, you are our guide for that and uh, we, will, uh, we will commit ourselves and uh, our uh, commitment is to make the patients and the healthcare workers to speak, speak out uh, about how they suffer uh, the incompetencies, the inadequacies of the system. I wouldn't say that it is people and person. Uh, we in our country are culturally a bit judgmental about focusing on the individual and punishing them and uh, um, you know a lot of people had to undergo the, uh, the suffering because of that and it is not only the patients who have suffered in our country but also the healthcare workers. I know a lot of healthcare workers who had to commit suicide out of disgust. So they ended up at the, uh, at the front end, uh, the sharp end of uh, healthcare actually, uh, suffering the harm. So uh, changing attitude and uh, perception uh, is a big deal for us and request your presence and help and guidance towards that. And we are immensely grateful to all that what you do for saving patients in, on the globe. Thanks a lot, sir. Looking forward to more association. Thank you. We are all Thank promising to be guardian angels. Can we hear yes. it loud and clear? Yes. 
So oh, that's a big astounding yes to become guardian angels of patient safety. And thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for what you're all doing. You're doing a great job. I'm really thank impressed. You. Thank you. Please do rest now. Thank you so much, sir. Please <laughs> take rest. Thank you.